Well, Tim and worship team, thank you so much for leading us in the way that you have. We uh, are so blessed to have so many folks that are not just talented but, and, and, and willing, but are faithful members of the body. They, they want it to be this antiphony of members singing to members and it going back and forth. And so we're just so thankful for that. And just so you know, Tim has stepped in the last couple of weeks and will again this afternoon as Gordon and Kathy are uh, with their family. And so Lord willing, uh, we'll have everyone back with us again next week. But we are so grateful for our time today. So if you would, go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to First Peter. Now, here's how this is going to lay out for the next while. We are going to, this actually will be the last message we have in First Peter until the beginning of the new year. And Lord willing, we'll be able to come back and, and visit the middle of this chapter, which actually is a decent transition. I'll explain that in just a minute. But what we're going to be doing is beginning next week, which will be the first Sunday following Thanksgiving, is just walking through the key aspects of Advent. We'll talk about hope and joy and peace and love and Christ himself as he is the fulfillment of all of Scripture. And so as we look forward to that and have that time together um, and focus on the season that we have before us, including that time, that Advent time culminating with our Christmas Eve service, which this year is on Christmas Eve, then I want... It's funny. Um, so just, I just want to encourage you to, uh, you know, just commit to that whole time. And we're actually also going to have readings for you beginning next week that you'll be able to read uh, all throughout the week regarding Advent and just prepare your hearts and minds. And actually, for those of you who still have children in the home, I want to encourage you to let this be a time to get some momentum on what it looks like to have family worship in your house. Basically, have at least a couple of nights a week where you're having to dinner together. I know it can be challenging. But as you have dinner together, take the scriptures, read them together, okay, around the table as you're, as you're done. Pray together. If you're of the mind to just sing a song, that's great. But this idea of read, pray, sing can be so simple. It doesn't have to take a real long time. But I promise you that the satisfaction of knowing that you've led your family and understanding in the culture we live in, that could be some, some heads of households basically could be single moms and they have a really difficult task. So whatever the case is, I just want to encourage you to use those scripture readings as an opportunity to, you know, without getting into New Year's resolutions, but let it be something that gains traction heading into next year to actually sit around the table together as a family, read the scriptures and have a little bit of family worship throughout the week. So anyway, just some encouragement there. As, uh, as we move ahead into this, you know, just great, fantastic time of the season that we have. So, First Peter, we're going to be in chapter 2, and we're going to be in verses 4 through 10 today. Now, what we have really is, is up until this point, essentially, we have God making very clear that as he is working and writing through Peter, as he's breathed out by the Holy Spirit, this idea that the people of God— now, particularly in Asia Minor, but this applies to all of us, that the people of God are what is called elect exiles, those that God has called to himself, okay, that he has elected to himself, not because of anything they've done, just simply because like the children of Israel, I love them because I love them. He has just simply chosen to love. And in that great mercy, he has actually then called us to himself to see Christ, to see our need for Christ, and to come to him. But what he wants the church to remember in, the, in, the, in light of the fact that they are facing so much persecution and difficulty is that this is not home. So they're elect, but they're still exiles. They are being made for a different home, okay? And we know this. We know that our hope really hinges on this idea that we are made for a different and better place. Now, if we get that wonky, that's where you end up seeing some pretty unusual, if not just flat out nutty stuff that we've seen in the last 18 months of how the church has married itself to politics and tried to make really a world for themselves here, a kingdom for themselves here. And that's just not how it works. That doesn't mean to be a pacifist. I'm just simply saying the extremes of some of this is, is showing and telling of the fact that for many, many years from pulpits, there have been proclamations of well, here's 12 steps to have a better this and 10 steps to have a better that. This pragmatism has ended up making its way so that the fruit of it is being seen, trying to make heaven here on earth. Now, it doesn't mean don't obey because we are to obey, right? We are to follow him. We are to, in a sense, want to see justice occur. We want to see things made better, but we also know that they're just reflections and shadows of the reality. When Christ comes and brings himself before us and brings us to himself, 
and for him to establish his kingdom reign, we will then know that we are home because he is our home. In the process of this, he's also called us to live holy lives while we are exiles. And what holiness shows us and what we saw in chapter 1 is essentially this. As we understand the fact that we are exiles living in a foreign land, sojourning, so many other metaphors could be used like ambassadors, okay, foreigners traveling through, that we understand too that holiness is, that should be our MO. That should be how we live our lives in this world. Why? Well, a couple of things. First of all, it draws attention to this, this fact that we are guided by standards of our new homeland. We're not driven by the standards of this foreign land that we live in. We are driven by the standards of what the scriptures have laid out is the kingdom of heaven. And so as we try to live that out, it does a couple of things for us. First of all, it bolsters our hope. Again, they're facing persecution. When we are living holy lives, when things are tense, when things are are difficult, when there are trials of various types, there is a temptation not to hold out hope. Because there is a very great sense of hopelessness that anything is going to be taken away that is difficult here. And you know what happens? We tend to run after our go-to sins to either give us some kind of pacified sense of feeling comfortable or pleasured for just a moment. What we're doing in that moment is we're saying we don't trust that God's going to fulfill his promises of home on our timeline. And so we cut it short and we run after things that are the way, according to the world standards, instead of the holy standards of God. Now, what it does, though, is while we are living in a difficult land, in a difficult time, we see that as we live holy lives, again, not trying to be perfectionist, but we do pursue him with all that we are, that as we do so, it actually bolsters our hope to wait. It increases. It, in a sense, it's like working out or training for a marathon. You end up running miles and distances you never thought you could simply because it was incremental. And you know what? We've seen in chapter 1 that God sovereignly uses out of necessity difficulty to train us to hope for a better place. Because what happens when we are struggling in this world, we are reminded of the brokenness of this world. We are reminded of the brokenness of even ourselves as we try to make our way in this world. And so God does a couple of things. He reminds us that this world cannot satisfy us and that our hope lies elsewhere. And as we lengthen out or stretch out that pursuit of his standard, it increases the stamina of our hope to live waiting for kingdom come. Now, That doesn't mean by any means that we are um, kind of useless, just biding our time, doing nothing. Because what we start to enter into now is him saying, okay, while you are then exiles, remember this, you are exiles together. I'm sorry. I'm excited. I'm sweating. We are exiles together. Together. He is building us into something that he indwells in this place. It's the idea of tabernacle. It's the idea of temple. Where it has always been, no matter how fortified the structure, any temple that we've ever seen erected in the Old Testament, any reference that was ever made to it in the New Testament, has always been temporal. Because it always pointed to The reality, we see that in the book of Hebrews, right? Especially chapter 9. All that needed to be cleansed, all that had to be purified for God's own people of his own possession to be made his. Christ alone did that in the, the, yes, the the holiest of holies. The reality of where the holy of holies in the temple or tabernacle was, the very presence of God before the throne of God, Christ satisfied as priest, as sacrifice. So what he says, what he's starting to say here as we are being built up together as living stones, that we are to sojourn together through this exilic life as the church. Plain and simple. So let's read the text. 
starting in verse 4. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobeyed the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Verse 10, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let's pray. God, we pray that your word would accomplish and bear the fruit that you, Holy Spirit, design and empower for it to do and accomplish even now. We pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. As Peter is painting this picture of what it looks like to be the church as we travel and sojourn through this foreign land together, he uses a lot of mixed metaphor. There's a lot of different images going on here. What's interesting is that how distinctly Jewish these images are in light of the fact that he is speaking to a predominantly Gentile audience in Asia Minor. Again, that area of Turkey as the gospel migrates west. Distinctly Jewish. Now, there's a couple of reasons for this. First of all, I mean, Peter cannot get this out of his system because he is a Jew. And he has always taken a lean into Jews and seeing them come to faith in Christ. However, knowing that this is on the back end of his life, he has also completely embraced the idea that as the Gentiles, as it has even been said in the Old Testament, as, as the Gentiles are then included into that summons, that call to repent and become part of God's people, that the Gentiles are what Paul would say are grafted in. Now, I want to make a clear distinction, although we don't have time to go into the real nuances here. But I do want to say very clearly, no one is going to be in heaven because they are merely Jewish by birth. There is no Jew simply going to be in heaven just because they're Jewish. Everyone must come through Christ. Everyone. Everyone. That is the people. In fact, we'll see it even exclusively in this text. Only those who come to faith in Christ, Jew or Gentile, will be part of his kingdom. In fact, when Paul speaks of the mystery of the gospel, which is a motif that he uses regularly, it's actually a twofold mystery. You can especially see this in Romans chapters 9 through 11. Because the mystery is that the Gentiles can actually be grafted into these spiritual promises as they're kept through the person of Abraham. And they're actually then again grafted or placed into all of that line of promises, those, those incredible promises of blessing. Those are spiritual promises that are going to be realized one day when Christ comes for his people. And in the meantime, as he continues to draw in all of that full number of those that will be his, both Jew and Gentile alike. So it's a mystery that the Gentiles can be included, but it's also a mystery to the Jews because the Jews have to understand that now the scales have been taken away from their eyes and they have to see that the Messiah has already come. They're not waiting for another. Christ was that Messiah. So as we do this, we need to understand a couple of things that I think are just some principles that underline this. And these would be things that you would understand. So for instance, what you do in life flows from really who you are. These are just some really practical things to keep in mind. Or your passion reflects what you treasure the most. And by passion, I mean the things that you talk about, dream about, curiously search after. It's what you treasure the most. 
Our purpose as a people is determined by the one who has made us a people. I mean, there's a real sense that any church's mission statement simply must be a re-articulation of the Great Commission to go and make disciples, right? I mean, it's not that tricky. A friend of mine, when he wrote a book uh, on church planting is not for wimps is the name of the book. And Mike uh, McKinley writes about this idea that he gets a little bit tired of vision statements and mission statements in the local church because it seems like it's pretty obvious. And what he likens that to in many ways are the Yankees, Yankees organization. So even though I'm a Red Sox fan, I'm going to use this example because it's actually a really good example. So there's no one, I don't care if you are the scout for a farm team or you are heading out to the cornfields of Iowa and you are looking at a prospect, you could go to the most distant person in the organization, ask them, what is your purpose as an organization? And they will all tell you to a person. It's to win a world championship. I mean, that's the purpose. Everything is leveraged. The incredibly high payroll, I don't want to get into sports talk, but whatever, however they leverage their lives and their organization, everything, and to a man, everybody in the organization knows the purpose is simply to win a championship. And that means bringing in the right people, bringing in the right coaches, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes to spend, whatever. There's a sense that that should be the case for the church. Now, it is a shepherding move for us as a body of Christ to remind ourselves that our mission, our purpose as a church is to preach and proclaim the gospel, making disciples, discipling one another. It's all about disciple making, following Christ while in this world. To a man, to a woman, to a child at Milford Bible Church, we should be able to be asked at any moment in time, what is the purpose? Even if you don't get the catchphrase of knowing him and making him known, but whatever it is, it simply should be to make disciples, to follow Christ together. It should be so incredibly natural and built into who we are as a people that at, at just a passing question, that should be our answer. See, we were born again to a living hope. Peter now wants us to understand that as a people of this living hope, we are to sojourn and walk through together with some particular perspectives. That we are being built into this house, this spiritual house, this worshiping house that's not brick and mortar as we're sitting in, but as flesh and blood as we gather with. That he wants us to understand a few things in this passage. That we're first of all built to worship. That's going to be in verses 4 through 8. We are built together to worship him. We're also built, though, by Christ. And this is such an important reminder that it's Christ alone that makes us a people and it's Christ alone that gives us our purpose and eventually becomes what we're purposed for, which is really the third thing. He wants us to remember that we are built for a purpose as a spiritual house. And that's going to be to proclaim the excellencies of our God. So the first thing is we're built to worship. Look at verse 4. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves are like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So first of all, we come to him, we approach him, we follow him. There's only one that we are built for, built by Christ. We come to him. We approach him. He is the living stone, as he says. But how's he describe it? He's the living stone who what? He was rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious. But don't forget the fact that he's saying he's alive. We approach a living God. This is not your favorite actor. This is not your favorite musician. This is not your favorite athlete. This is the living God of the cosmos who spoke a word where nothing could bounce off of anything and God the Son went and created it and God the Holy Spirit holds it all together. This is who we come before. He is living and he pierced history 
came in the middle of our timeline to ransom us and to make us into his pe- a people of his own possession. But both as he came the first time, then died, and then rose from the dead in all ways. You can go and read John chapter 1. He was not accepted at first as being that, the one that would, would be raised from the dead. I'm sorry, as the one who would be the Messiah. He was rejected by his own people. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes. All those in leadership among the Jews. No, no, no. This is not the one. This is not how it happens. After his resurrection, all manner of denial. Because the power structures that he would absolutely confront among the Romans. No, he's not alive. Rejected by men. But what matters? But he's chosen and precious by God. Now, this is important because, of course, you know that God is, I mean, that God the Son is chosen. It's Jesus Christ. He is God's purpose in this world. Of course, you know this. But what you need to understand is how it then reflects on who we are as living stones, which is where he goes next. See, what he means here is that Jesus Christ is the only one that is acceptable to God as a person. But then where does he go next? As we come to him, the living stone who was rejected but accepted by God, as living stones, look at the next verse, you yourselves, like living stones, he's the living stone accepted by God. We are living stones being made into a people. But what does he say? He says, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So we come to him, the living God, who's the living stone, who is rejected by men, who is accepted alone by God because God alone is, is, Christ alone is acceptable to God. We come to him as living stones and the only way that we are acceptable to him and the only way that anything that we do in offering ourselves in service as Romans 12, 1 and 2 would say, living sacrifices to do whatever the Lord calls us to do. The only way that who we are and what we do is acceptable to God is because Jesus Christ is acceptable to the Father alone. There's nothing that we can do that's acceptable to God. Apart from Christ. Christ. This is how dependent we are as a people and how centered we must be upon the person of Jesus Christ. But this also speaks to something. We being living stones, we have been raised from the spiritual dead, whereas Christ was raised from the physical, raised from the physical dead. We are raised from the spiritual dead, having been dead in our sins and trespasses. We are made alive and we are accepted by God on the basis of Jesus Christ alone. So he's made us into a people and what holds us together is the fact that Christ has caused us to be acceptable to God. There's no good work. Or as Lydia said, the lack of biting of your siblings, which she actually bit some, so hopefully that is over. But the idea is that there's nothing that you can do and there's no less bad that you cannot do to still be okay with God. It's not a comparison to anyone else in all of history except Christ. The question's never been, are you better than your cousin, your crazy uncle, whatever? Well, of course he's not going to make it, but I'm better than that. It's always been, am I even as good as Christ? Oh, well, of course not. God doesn't expect that of us. I mean, come on. Yes, he does. He expects it not because he's being mean or capricious. What he actually is doing is simply out of his character, his holy nature. He cannot have sin in his presence. There's nothing acceptable about sin. All sin has to be atoned for, covered, removed. And he demands perfection. And Christ is the only one who could meet that demand. But then, because our sin is present... Christ then dies so that the sacrifice that Christ makes is also acceptable to God. So we are saved by Christ's life and we are also saved by Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. So when I say that you're a living stone, you are a living stone in Jesus Christ 
If indeed you have come to faith believing that Christ lived a life that was impossible for you to live, that he died a death that you absolutely deserve, he rose from a grave that you deserve to rot in and eventually wind up in hell, but he went through all of that in death and then to be raised again to new life. That when you own that because of what the Spirit of God puts in you as faith, you are a living stone based on all of that. And we are being built together as people who, that is our common ground. How in the world could mask mandates or politics or anything else cause a division among people who understand they're alive only on the basis of Jesus Christ? We don't deserve any good thing whatsoever. How could anything stand in the way of our fellowship if we're in Christ? So we're being built This literally means being fashioned together. The parts are being fashioned together is what the word built means. As living stones. This word for stones, life on, is this. It's hewn stones. They each are cut so that they fit in such a way that the structure is both protection, it is security, and there's also a measure of adornment. Each one of us are making up the whole. And the way he describes that is, you're being built into a spiritual house. It's exactly what it sounds like it is. Except remember this, that whereas you have God the Father, okay, who is the one who is established and that we want to enter into that presence in that temple, that tabernacle, has sent his son, who is God the Son, as priest and sacrifice, that when he says spiritual, this is pneumatikos, this is, this is spirit. You have Trinity right at work right here in this passage. You're being built into a house that is characterized by the Holy Spirit. And the best way I know how to summarize that is by the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This should be the characteristic of this oikos, this house. And the oikos for them, for the Gentiles, was not that different than the Jews. It would have had multiple generations living in it. It probably had more than even one household living in it or near. We are a diverse group of people brought together, but to all be marked by the fruit of the Spirit as we go about and live our lives held together by the fact that we are living stones only acceptable to God because of Christ who holds it all together. That's what we're being built into. That's what we're being built by. And this is for worship. We worship the God that we come before. We offer spiritual sacrifices, which is our lives, which is our service, which is our spiritual gifts that we would use and say whatever it is for the purpose of Christ and exalting him. Use me, Lord. It's all an act of worship. All of it. The giving of your offerings is an act of worship. It's not a tip. It's not something dutiful. I mean, there is a duty to it, don't get me wrong. But it should be an act of worship. It's not a bill to be paid. We are a holy priesthood. There's no need for priests to go through. He is making us into that, that we have direct access to the Father. The priests were those who could access God the Father personally. We are able to do that. All together, yet individually, but all together we are all priests. We can all go to Him. There's no more need to lay down sacrifices because Christ is alive who already sacrificed Himself. As we make these offerings, we are literally fulfilling what the Word of God has said, as he says in verse 6, when he quotes Isaiah 20, 28, 16. Behold, I'm laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. In Isaiah 28, he's actually speaking about the vindication of Israel that's to come. 
It's not taking something out of context and saying, oh, don't wait, you know, don't worry, you know, everything's going to be fine. Or as, as, and I don't mean this as a jab if you, if you use Jeremiah 29, 11, but there's a great argument that, you know, the plans that God has for us, the plans to prosper and all that, it's not even been fulfilled yet. And actually, when you look at the context of Jeremiah 29, it's awful. And so I, I love the ambition and the, and the intention of so many to say, oh, the Lord has great things for you. I mean, that's true, but it may not be anything that's realized in this world. Because when we think of plans to prosper, we think, okay, the bills will be paid, the job will be better, the marriage will be healed, the, uh, you know, I'll be out of debt, I'll, I'll get an advancement or this or that. We're holding off, but what are we hoping for when we hear it that way? When we hear it that way, we're actually hoping for a little bit of heaven on earth. Now, I understand that we can want that, but that's actually completely counter to what Jeremiah means, and it's actually counter to what Isaiah is saying. Isaiah is saying the ultimate vindication of God's people, especially Israel, is going to happen when the cornerstone comes, and when the cornerstone comes, then again. Christ. So as they're going through difficulty and persecution in Asia Minor from outside forces and authorities, he's saying one day God is going to vindicate you, but that vindication is going to come through the very person who is making you into a living stone. Rest in him. Trust in him. Understand that this will happen one day. You can believe what he has said. Just hold on, but hold on together. You are built together as living stones. You are designed, literally designed to be together as you sojourn in this exilic life together. But then he goes on, he says, that's for those who believe. Your vindication will be there, but what about those who don't believe? Well, he then quotes Isaiah chapter 8. A stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. There's a couple of different meanings for the idea of cornerstone. It could also mean a headstone. Not a headstone as in a, a, a funeral plot. Or I should say a capstone, let's put it that way. So cornerstone can actually have a couple of different placements. One is what you normally would think of, which would be the largest block. In fact, if you go into any larger city or even, even in our city, you can see some of the older buildings, you will see a larger cornerstone on the edges of the buildings. They usually jut out just a bit. They're the largest rock or piece that has been cut and shaped. And really the foundation, it's not just symbolic. I mean, there's a structural veracity to the whole building because of this one stone. But because it sticks out, if you don't pay attention to it, you'll trip. There's also this idea of a capstone, which is when you look at an archway, okay, and they're built with blocks and the blocks look a little bit like wedges. You know, sadly for us, the closest we get to that is if you've ever tried to make a fire pit. And it looks so great when they show you commercials or you see some kind of video and everything just lines up so perfectly and you're like, I can't even do a circle. But anyway... So you have these edges. I've never experienced that. Other people have. So, but as you see these wedges and they make this arch, then what you'll see at the very top is a larger piece that's a larger wedge. It's a capstone. Oftentimes it's engraved for what you're entering into. But also structurally what happens when that stone is set in, physics kicks in. It pushes a pressure on the arch all the way down to the ground and makes it firm. You want to knock it down? You don't knock it down by trying to hammer away at just one of them, although that would do it. It would take forever. You get rid of the capstone, it's done. So there's a sense that, and I, I, I don't, I, I, I'm not given to speculation when we try to just exposit the scriptures, okay? But because of these two different images, there's a lot that makes sense to me that when it comes to the church, that once you are a believer in Christ, you understand that the cornerstone is now your capstone. You enter in through him, to him and for him. He is why you exist. And you go and you enter, you come to him in worship. But that cornerstone, for those who do not, have not entered in just yet, they're not even paying attention, and he is the corner of the building, of the structure that they cannot ignore, they will trip. And how do we know they've tripped? They've tripped in their disbelief. They don't believe that he is the foundation for which all hope lies, that their very salvation depends on. They don't believe it. And so because of this, we see very practically that Peter is making all these references to temple and to Israel. He's making all these references even though he's speaking to Gentiles. He's speaking how spiritually the church has become the fulfillment of what this is for 
the temporary temple is now not just in Christ when he said, you know, if you tear this temple down in John, when he says, if you tear this temple down, I'll build it back up in three days. There he's referring to himself. Christ ascends in Acts. Every other time you see the temple referred to, it's the people of God. He indwells his people. So you had a physical structure. You had tents in the Exodus. You had the temple that David wanted to build but couldn't because of the blood on his hands that Solomon did. Very wonderful, incredible wonder of the world. You, you, you can find some pieces of it today. Christ becomes the temple. Now we are. All to show that all of this imagery that was pointing there, that God is drawing from all the nations of people for himself. He's making us into his temple. We are the last temple until he comes and establishes the new earth and the new Jerusalem. We're it, the church. The church. There's no other land to be garnered. There's no other buildings to be built. Now there's there's some prophecies to be done, but the church, don't miss this, is the temple of God. So he also says in verse 8, and I don't want to ignore this. He says in verse 8, they stumbled because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Now there's lots of speculation and interpretation on what this could mean. First of all, you could think that as they were destined to do refers to they stumbled. So basically a person is going to stumble if they disobey the word. You're destined to do that. You're destined to stumble if you disobey. That's absolutely true. If you disobey the word of God, you're going to stumble and fall and fail. Unfortunately, Peter is very consistent in saying that all things are controlled and sovereignly ruled by our holy God, and he doesn't let us off the hook. And while we're not going to go into great detail, another, I would say, I don't want to say extreme, although it might be extreme to some, another extreme view would be this idea of what's called double predestination, which I don't like using theological terms ever in the pulpit, but it's kind of hard to ignore here, is some people believe that as surely as God has elected, even before the foundations of the earth, those who would be his, and he doesn't do so by looking ahead as if they're going to be good enough, because that's not how we're saved, right? He loves us because he loves us, okay? But in election, on the pro side, that we're elected to, to eternity, to be with him. That some believe in a double predestination that also there is an election, so to speak, for those who go to hell. So everyone, not just by default, but by actual decision, that there are those who go to heaven, those who go to hell, and all of that is predetermined by God. Now, obviously, you can go to extremes in that and think that, why do we do missions then? Why do we even pray? You become fatalists. Well, the problem is, though, he actually includes in here the idea of disobedience, which is an action, which is a choice. So here's the deal. I don't know exactly what Peter is saying here, but here's what I do know about the consistency of what Scripture would have to say on the matter. And that is certainly you cannot ignore the fact that election is a Bible word, that predestination even is a Bible word, that whatever you understand about the sovereign work of God, it is God's side of the equation, if you want to call it an equation. Meaning, this is stuff that only God knows. God is not bound by space or time, okay? So to say that God only chooses people based on some future event is actually outside of the character of God because God doesn't exist on a timeline. He just doesn't. There's no time where God dwells in the heavenlies. The idea though here would be this, that certainly we also know in scripture that there are places where God has destined people to fail. Pharaoh was going to be an antagonist against Moses and he didn't have a chance. But you know what he did? God interacted with Moses again and again to go and call Pharaoh to repentance, and he kept resisting. In order to deliver his people for his glory and his redemption, there had to be an antagonist in the story. Pharaoh was going to be it. Or Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. Now again, I know that doesn't sound nice and loving of God, but what we have to acknowledge is there is some pretty clear translation here that's difficult. Now where are we going to fall? I don't think you have to have a definitive position as much as a submission. That you may not like it, but if that's what God says and that's what it is, then you're going to trust God's economy. You're going to trust what the Word of God has to say. But I think we also, I think there's also room here that whereas he may have absolutely destined some, which the Scriptures seem to indicate with like Esau and Pharaoh, that some are absolutely destined to have no chance, basically. 
that I think to another degree, that doesn't necessarily mean that that applies in the same way to everyone in history. Now, me personally, I am, I, I, I go back and forth, not in the sense of God's, I'll, I'll go back and forth, but within a range. And that range would simply be, I absolutely believe in the fact that God elects us unto salvation before the foundations of the earth. And that's based on his sovereign, merciful love. That's not based on any future action he, re, he sees in me. It's the same kind of sovereign love that he gave when Moses said, whom shall I say sent me? I am. And then he says, why? He says, Tell them that I love them because I love them. God has decided to show his glory through loving some. Our first thought is that's not fair because we're Western and because we're human. But the fact is we forget the fact that none of us deserve to be saved. That if there were 10 people, they should have written 10,000 hymns of mercy and grace. We have a hard time with some of these doctrines because of what it feels like to us as humans and we forget that God's ways are not our ways. We inflict upon him our emotion, our sense of justice to God's ways. All I'm saying simply is this, guys. When the scriptures simply say before the foundations of the earth, God saved and God determined like he does in Ephesians 1, I believe what that says. When he says whosoever will come to him, I believe that as well. Why? Because the whosoever will part is what I see with my human eyes. When a person repents and has faith, then I know that God must have chosen them before the foundations of the earth. Why would I go and preach to people? Why would Adoniram Judson spend years of his life and see many members of his family die, some pretty awful disease-ridden deaths, and not see one convert, and yet hold to this doctrine? Why would he do that? Because God sent him and God told him, according to the scriptures, to go and proclaim the gospel to all flesh. We do it because that's what God has called us to do. We don't know who's going to come and who doesn't. We're not God. So we preach and we proclaim and we love and it's worth it because that's what God has called us to do. We get too caught up in an end game that we're never going to know this side of heaven. We are called just to obey in the moment, to sojourn together as a church, as living stones, for a purpose of proclaiming his, his excellencies, which is where he goes next. We are built together by Christ in chapter 9, I'm sorry, verse 9, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. So again, a chosen race, there's no way around it. He has chosen you by his grace, not by human choice, but by God's choice. And he's made you a, holy, a royal priesthood. Whereas before, he talks about you being a holy priesthood. Here is a royal priesthood. If you are in Christ, you are an heir. He's already talked about that in chapter 1. You have an inheritance that's being kept for you. And you're being made for it while you're here. You're an heir with God the Son. You are a royal priesthood. That's locked. It's beautiful. He's also made us into a holy nation. I'm not saying everywhere that it speaks of Israel that's displaced by the church, but I am saying where, just like where Paul says, not all Israel is Israel, but he talks about a spiritual Israel, including Gentiles and Jews. I absolutely believe that there are many references that say that what he's talking about as far as the fulfillment of the covenant promises of God, that absolutely is the church. And as he uses all this temple metaphor, in all these analogies, he is absolutely saying that the fulfillment of what God is making for himself a people includes the Gentiles. It includes us, guys. That we have just as much royal inheritance as anyone because of who Christ has made us to be. He's made us into a holy nation. We are kind of a nation living in a foreign land. That's why he uses, that's why Paul uses in 2 Corinthians 5 the idea of being an ambassador. You represent a nation while in a foreign land, you're governed by the rules of your, just like an embassy in a sense. You're governed by the rules within that embassy of the homeland, even though you're on foreign soil. That applies to us. We're a holy nation here. We're governed by the distinct standards of our God's kingdom while we are living in a foreign land. And I love that we're a people of his own possession. Time won't permit, but as he uh, one of the quotes you could go to is Romans 9, 24 through 26, but there's no reason really to go there because what he's referencing is Hosea. Because Romans 9, 24 really through 26, 
references Hosea and Gomer's relationship, how Hosea was going to be the deliverer. Gomer represented unfaithful Israel. She was an unfaithful wife. Hosea was commanded to go after her and and make her his wife and to love her unconditionally. And as a note, Hosea is taken from the same verb as Joshua, which is the Old Testament version of Jesus. He's the deliverer, the merciful deliverer who goes after the unfaithful wife. The reason I mention that is because he mentions it again when he talks about our being built for a purpose. So just hang on to that idea for just a minute. As we, as we conclude this idea, as he goes on down to verse 10, he says that once you were not a people, well, I'm sorry, at the, at the, the second half of verse 9, when he says that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. But then he says in verse 10, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So God has built us together as living stones so that we worship him. We've been built together by Christ, the living stone himself. He's made us his own. He's made us a holy nation, a royal priesthood. He's made us a people of his own possession. And he's made us that for a purpose, to proclaim his excellencies in this world. We're built to worship, we're built by Christ, and we're built for a purpose, which is to proclaim the excellencies of God. But those excellencies are marked by something because right after that is where he says that as we proclaim these excellencies, what does he talk about? He talks about deliverance. You preach and teach and proclaim the excellencies, the moral purity, the beauty of God based on the fact that you've been taken from darkness into light. How is that anything but gospel imagery? Or when he says in verse 10, you were once not a people, but now you are. And he actually means this for everyone. It's not just, oh, the the Gentiles weren't a people, which technically they weren't, but now they are a people. But also the Jews weren't the people of promise, spiritually speaking, until they also came to Christ, the living stone. So the church, Jew and Gentile alike, has all come to be part of him for a very special purpose, and that is to declare, divulge, publish And it's all characterized by celebration, the excellencies of our God who is merciful in the gospel in delivering us out of darkness and into spiritual light. That is our purpose. That is why we've been made a people. That we put on display his moral virtue and his purity, but we do so with a celebratory manner. We put on display and we publish and we proclaim his merciful redemptive work. We speak of what it means to be taken out of darkness and into light. Because then in verse 10, when he speaks of this, once you were not a people, but now you are, he goes back to reference Hosea. He makes the reference again. Mm, Not going to turn there, but let me just reference in Hosea chapter 1 and then in 2. If you just go back and read it on your own, you'll see where they have children. And those children have names. And those names are actually, now well, I've got to read it to you. Just give me half a second. Go to Hosea chapter 1 if you want to flip over there real quick. It'll be better for you to see it than for me to explain it. You have Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. It's down there. Go past Daniel. Okay, so just real quickly, 4, 6, and 9. Verse 4, and the Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel. So Hosea is going to have a wife. That wife is Gomer. She's unfaithful. She represents Israel. They're going to have children. These children are going to represent something in God's redemptive work. And the Lord said to him, call his name Jezreel. For in just a little while, I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel. And I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. She conceived again, verse 6, and bore a daughter. And the Lord said to him, call her name No Mercy. For I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them all. Okay, well, so far this doesn't sound very good, Pastor. So, okay, let's go to verse 9. And let's continue the bad news. And the Lord said, call his name not my people, for you are not my people and I am not your God. This is what we were without Christ. You go to chapter 2. 
Verse 22. Well, actually, let's start in verse 20. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. And in that day I will answer, declares the Lord, I will answer the heavens, and they shall answer the earth, and the earth shall answer the grain, the wine, and the oil, and they shall answer Jezreel. And I will sow her for myself in the land, and I will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say to not my people, you are my people. And he shall say, you are my God. All three kids who have these pretty awful names of judgment, a lack of mercy, a lack of blessing. Upon their repentance and God's gracious call to repentance, in a sense, are given new names. And the names are juxtaposed to the names he gave them at first of what separated them. They were once not his people, but now they are. Peter is making this reference. He's drawing in that this is the fulfillment of that in the church. So if if the imagery is not strong enough for you, we apart from submitting to Christ are harlots, prostitutes, unfaithful women. Unfaithful men, adulterers. And when he calls us to himself, he says, not only is that removed, I'm giving you my name. I'm showing you my mercy. The weight of this as it falls on the Gentile hearers, as well as the Jews themselves going, well, that's not just for us. And the Gentiles being broken over, you mean that's for us? Guys, this should characterize what it means to be living stones. That we are so enamored with the mercy of God, we cannot help but in our unity proclaim the excellencies of what it means to be drawn in and made new. We just can't help it. So, I ask you, first of all, are you even a living stone? Have you come to a place to where you realize the living stone, Christ, has lived that life? He has died that death and he's been raised from the dead for you because you can't do anything to save yourself. He is not your co pilot, He is not your, your better half. He is your savior. He is your resurrector, your deliverer. Are you even a living stone? If you're not, we invite you to visit with one of the elders in a few moments. They'll be hanging around in the room in different places. Come and talk to any of us. We'd love to share that with you. But if you're the church, let me ask you this. Do you really embrace the idea that you are this stone, this living stone that's hewn and put together, uniquely cut to fit within the body of Christ for a purpose of declaring his excellencies? Are you using your spiritual gifts in the local body? Are you proclaiming the goodness and the gospel of being delivered? And you have to ask yourself, if I'm not, then why not? It's not about personality traits. It's about treasure and passion. I would encourage you to go back to chapter 1 and remind yourself of why you have the hope that you do. Hang out there long enough and see if you get to a place where you can't help but, not talk, but talk about it. To share it. So Christian, you are a living stone. You are traveling through this foreign land and you are designed to do it with the church, with the people of God who are also living stones. Let's pray. Our God, we thank you for your mercies to us and your kindness. We thank you for all that we've seen put on display today, all that we've sung, all that we've heard about what it means to be made alive in Christ Jesus. I pray that you would forgive us for treating lightly the idea of the church and what it means to be part of a people who are traveling together. It it also, God, it, it does bring so much shame on churches that have made, made themselves more into a, you know, partisan group or, or a, a lobbying organization instead of distinctly 
a royal priesthood, a holy nation, traveling together in a foreign land to proclaim the goodness of the kingdom to come. And God, I'm still struck too by, in that proclamation word, is that distinct characteristic of celebration. Lord, may we be a church that is so enamored with what it means to be redeemed, not to get caught up in some of the finer points of different theological perspectives, even the ones mentioned this morning. They can be so divisive, but they are not primary, actually, in what we would be drawn together and and rally around, what we believe about election or predestination or double predestination. Any of those big ideas, they're not primary. What we do believe is primary is that you alone save, you alone call men to yourself. And the only evidence we have of seeing that is when people repent and by faith come to you. And that we, in the meantime, are called to proclaim these excellencies and we don't know the results. And if the results do happen, it's all because of you. So you get all the celebration. So Lord, help us to be marked by people as people who are so overwhelmed with your grace and your mercy that we're almost in disbelief, but not quite. And that we also are so riddled with celebration, the fact that we have a home waiting. And remembering that Peter is writing this to people who have no reason on earth to celebrate. Let it mark us, O God, for your glory, your namesake. Amen.